First, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. And then we're going to jump into Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, don't worry. It'll be on the big Bible in the sky. But 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4 says this. Saul's son Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, she dropped him, and he became crippled. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that God, someone shout God. God. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Um, This is an interesting story in the book of 2 Samuel in regards to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Someone shout Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Say that 10 times fast. No, don't do it. You might cuss in church. Just kidding. Um, One thing about Mephibosheth that is crazy, that at the age of five, he was crippled. Not because of a crazy stunt that he did like Pastor Mark did, but he got crippled because of what someone did to him. Someone that was supposed to nurse him dropped him. Someone that, was meant, someone that was meant to care for him ended up being the means to where he got crippled. And I've come to this realization that a lot of us here, the hurt that some of us in church have experienced isn't necessarily something through a choice that you made, but some of the areas of your life that are crippled is because of choices other people have made in your life. Someone that you thought you loved committed suicide. Someone you thought you would be married to divorced you. Someone you thought that would be there forever, that father, that mother just left you and abandoned you. And they have left you crippled. But I've come with a word this morning that God works all things for our good to those who are called and live according to his purpose. If there are any believers in the house this morning, can someone give God praise today? That is the business our God is in. And that is the business God wants you to be in when it comes to having a relationship with him. But the thing that I want us to all understand, something that we need to solidify across the stage right now before we go into the points and how do we get to a place to where, you know, where God can deliver us from our damage, where God can take us from being damaged and walk us into destiny. We have to understand that this point, you know what, no one escapes it. And that we are all damaged people. The Bible says that we are all born into sin. There is no person on earth other than Jesus who was birthed and lived a perfect life. Anybody, I need all the wives to say amen. Because, you know, come on somebody. Anybody make a a couple mistakes here and there. Both hand, one hand and a foot up this morning. You know what I mean? Every one of us in this place are damaged, emo- either emotionally, physically, maybe financially. Some of, us is, some of us here spiritually. There is an issue in our life that is damaged, but the good news is God wants to work it all out. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 is so powerful. For we are God's masterpiece. You're not just a damaged piece that God wants to use. Someone shall, I'm his masterpiece. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I know there is so, you look at your life and you look at some of the damaged pieces. You see some of the broken pieces. But God says, before you even had a damage um, part, before you ever had a broken piece, I had a plan for you. A plan in order for you to prosper. A plan for you that was so great. A plan for you that was put in you before you were even birthed or born in your mother's womb. Someone shout out my masterpiece. Because someone can, um, can, we welcome Pastor Chad to the stage this morning. Pastor Chad, our worship pastor. I don't know if you know this. Pastor Chad is a master skilled musician when it comes to the bass guitar. Some people don't realize how incredibly skilled This man is. Can we just welcome Pastor Chad to the stage this morning? I love this man. 
Maddie, can you set the mic for him as he's getting his guitar ready? Um, here's the thing. When you give someone who's skilled pieces, they can make a masterpiece out of it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, and so to demonstrate this, um, I've asked Pastor Chad to play a song. And then after he plays the song, he's going to keep that same rhythm and sing other songs with the same rhythm of the first song. One of the songs I can't stand to this day that I was brainwashed in church, there were two songs. First song I can't stand. If you like it, man, God, you know, good for you. But two songs that I've just, I sing them too much. I remember we sing them two million times within two months. I was like, I'm tired of singing this song in church. We sing it over and over again. And one of the songs was Days of Elijah. Can't stand the song anymore. The other song was Trading My Sorrows. Man, they, I mean, they, I don't know how many movements at my local church I grew up that they made to this song. Anybody remember Trading My Sorrows? Pastor Chad, can you play, the, can you play it for us and sing it? And if you know the movements, how about you stand up and do it with me? In fact, can we all stand and have a second worship service? Amen. Glory to God. Stand to your feet in the name of Jesus. I'm trading my sorrows. Y'all know This it. is literally what we did in church. I'm trading my shame. I don't have a right arm, so I can't do that. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I know it's incredibly corny. I'm but just humor me this morning. Is that okay? Sickness, I think, right? Yep. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Have some joy in your face this morning. We sing yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Except I have two hands. Yes, Lord. Imagine Pastor Mark with two hands. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, and amen. Keep that same rhythm. Keep that same rhythm. Now play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Woo, little but that sound funky, little boy. Lamb. Mary had a little lamb. Fleece was white as snow. <laughs> Everywhere the Mary went. Mary went, Mary went. Everywhere the Mary went, a lamb was sure to go. <laughs> Come on. Give it up. For Ooh, that hurt. I should have done that. Woo, that really hurt. For, for all the millennials and young people here, um, I asked my kids, I was like, what song should Pastor Chad sing? And all my kids said this song. He did it first service. Wash me whip. Wash me nanny. Oh, Lord. Wash me whip, whip. Wash me nanny. You re are y'all are ready? Give it up for Pastor Chad this morning. Now watch me whip, now watch me nay nay, now watch me whip, nay nay, now watch me whip, now watch me nay nay, now watch me whip. Let's go! Now watch me nay nay. Give it up for Pastor Chad this morning, y'all. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. That God can take whatever damaged piece, broken piece, and he can make a masterpiece out of it. So we'll give God praise this morning. <laughs> Religious people hate this. People who only know the word but don't have a relationship with Jesus don't get this. That Jesus can take a mess and make a miracle out of it. Any miracles in the house this morning, praise God with me. Come on. Hi, anybody experience a miracle in your marriage? Anybody experience a miracle in your finance? Anybody experience a miracle in your mind and in your heart? Give God. Give God a praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter to his courts with praise. Give God thanks and gratefulness today. Amen. But the thing that gets people from giving God the craziest praise is that they're never open to, to the point that we are all damaged people. We are all imperfect people. Yes, we serve a perfect God, but someone shall, I am an imperfect vessel. Look to your neighbor and say, you're imperfect too. There is nothing, there is no human being as far as outside of Jesus Christ that is walking a perfect life. We are all damaged people. So, Pastor Mark, then how do we get from being damaged 
to being delivered to walking in the destiny. Point number one. Are you ready for this, church? Let me hear you. I can't hear you, church. Then point number one is you have to talk with the king with all your damaged goods. You get to talk to the king damaged. How do you do that? Through prayer. I, I don't know about you, but I've heard all the church cliches growing up, man. Like when you ever, if you've ever experienced damage, if you have ever experienced pain, one of the things that people would always tell me, man, you better, you got to praise your way out. Now, I, that sounds good spiritually, but that is, how do I walk that out practically? How do I, how, how do I get to experience deliverance that walks me into destiny? Psalms 34 verse 18 says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. God is drawn to your brokenness. God is drawn to your damage. Matthew 7, 7 says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. If that wasn't good enough, Matthew 21, 22. Jesus replied, I truly tell you, if you, have the faith, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself in the sea, and it will be done. But you can't allow, you will never be, you'll never see God do things if you don't allow God to do the main thing in your heart. Here's the thing, I've come to this realization. God won't heal what you hide. As long as you pretend You'll never be able to walk in his promises. And for some of us, we keep faking who we really are and then get mad because we're not getting into the destination that we want to get to. Um, I don't know about you, but Siri, whenever I would plug something within the GPS, she'll ask me this. Can I use your current location? Can I use your current location? Why? Because in order to get you from point A, in order to get you to point B, uh, point A is where you're currently at. And so if we're constantly faking where we're really at, we'll never get to, we, where, you know, to where we want to be at. Why? Because we are pretending to be something we're not. But what would happen if the church of God got to a place where we came to the king damaged? What would happen if we came to the king with all our issues? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I would, whenever I invite people to church, one of the number one things I get from people when I invite them to church, man, pastor, there's some things I got to work on. And I look at them as, and I, I say this, as if you can fix it all up yourself. There's no, why do you think Jesus went to the cross? To fix it! Why did God send his son to die on the cross? To make you perfect in Jesus. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the way to the Father. There is no other way outside of Jesus to get to heaven or to get to the Father. Does anybody believe that this morning? There are new age beliefs and there are new age traditions that are trying to make multiple ways to get to heaven, multiple ways to get, you know what, forgiveness, multiple ways to be, you know, to have your sins erased. There's only one way, and that is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ that when a person says, God, here I am with all my damaged goods, will you save my life? So, so, Pastor Mark, what are you saying? Are you saying that, you know, I'm supposed to come to God with my drunkenness? Yes. Are you saying I'm supposed to come to God with my porn addiction? Yes. Are you saying I'm, you, I'm supposed to come to God with my adultery? Yes. Because God can take dirt and make a human being out of it. Our God is still in the business of resurrection. Does anybody believe that this morning? Give God praise. God could have used diamonds. God could have used rubies. God could have used titanium. But he chose to use dirt to let you know it doesn't matter what dirt is put on you. It doesn't matter what dirt you put on yourself. I can breathe and life can come out of it. Someone give God praise this morning if you believe this. But you have to come to God with your damaged goods. Someone shout, I need to come to God. I need to talk with the king. Damaged. Number two. If we want to walk out of the damaged lifestyle that we're in, the damaged mindset we're in, the damaged, the, the damaged heart that we, that we have right now, be delivered and walk in the destiny. Point number two, we got to believe what the king says. We got to believe the word. Amen. 
Now, the story of Mephibosheth is so amazing. I don't have enough time to talk about, man, his entire life story. There's so many golden nuggets in regards to God's redemption power and God's love. But one of the things about Mephibosheth that most people don't know is that Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of King Saul, the king. King Saul is the guy who hates King David. And, and for 15 years of David's life, David is running, afraid that King Saul is going to kill him. I don't know how many times King Saul threw a spear at him. I don't know how many times that it's not written that King Saul tried to do some real shady, crazy stuff, man. I, the guy that was supposed to mentor him is trying to literally damage him. The guy that's supposed to be the one who raises him up to be the next king, mentor him, disciple him, be a spiritual father to him, is the one doing everything possible through all of his resources to kill David. Imagine this. God comes down and says, Carlos, you're going to be the next king of Israel. This is what God says to King David. He anoints him, glory bell, and says, you know what? You're going to be the next ruler of this nation. But the nation that you're supposed to be ruler over is now trying to find and kill you. That is the life of King David for 15 years. How much anger and resentment will you have towards this person? What kind of thoughts would you have in your mind to be able to react, just to be able to be able to, you know, enact vengeance? Well, there came this moment in the, in the life of Saul and Jonathan where they were in battle a few chapters before this in 2 Samuel. They were surrounded by the Philistine army. There was no way, no way out. King Saul got a bad report that his son had been murdered by the Philistines. In desperation and in fear of his life, Saul thought to himself, I don't want to be, ever, I don't want to be killed by the Philistines. I don't want to be killed by my enemy. So he committed suicide on the battlefield that day. Custom was, before, you know, before Jesus Christ, and a lot of kingdoms even after Jesus Christ, the nation that defeated their opposing nation, they would literally annihilate the entire bloodline of the king in hopes of not having someone from their lineage come back and seek vengeance against them. And so what ends up happening is, because of this trend the entire nation or the entire kingdom, the, the political party of Saul is, gets word that not only is Jonathan dead, the successor, but King Saul is. And so now it's only a matter of time before the Philistine army comes to Jerusalem or comes to Israel and kills everyone connected to the king. And so what we read in 2 Samuel chapter 4, 4, is that now there is was, there was, there was frantic, this frantic fear going throughout the house of King Saul in Israel. They are afraid of their life. And so they, they now know that what riches they had, what blessings they had is about to be eradicated and taken away. That their family life is about to be turned around. Their finances are about to be depleted. The, the good life that they have is not about to be stripped away. And so what do they do in desperation? They start frantically trying to take everything of value, whether it's silver cups, golden spoons, anything of value, they're trying to collect it because they now know they're about to be on the run. And whatever place they run to, they need to have something of value to be able to seek refuge. So while this nurse that has been put in care of Mephibosheth not only is she trying to take care of Mephibosheth, but she's also trying to take care of her own life, her family's life, in regards to finances for the next few years or however long they're going to live. So in the, in, the, in the process of trying to collect wealth and value through stuff, through things, she drops Mephibosheth. She didn't plan on dropping him. She didn't have a desire to see him crippled. She, there was no plan cooked up in her mind to be able to see the son of Jonathan crippled for the rest of his life. But at the age of five, this is what happened to Mephibosheth. And so for so many years, he has this damaged goods that he's constantly seeing. 
that he didn't do that someone else did to him because of lack of paying attention and laziness, lazy living. I don't know about you and how you, how would you feel to have a crippled marriage because of something some, someone else did in, in your life? How would you feel if someone crippled your mom or your dad and, and was the cause of splitting their marriage? How would you feel if someone came into your workplace that you spent so many years serving and rooted in, and they came in and said lies about you and, got to, and you got to a place, man, where no one trusted you. And when time came for elevation and promotion, they looked over you and picked this person who started all the negative comments. What would go through your mind? But we know this in regards to Mephibosheth, that Mephibosheth had a negative mindset through it all. But one thing that we do know, if we're going to walk in deliverance, if we're going to walk out of being, if we're going to walk out of a season of damage into a season of deliverance that will walk us into destiny, number one, we got to talk with the king with all our damage. Someone shall talk to the king damaged. But we got to believe what the king says. Why is it important to believe what the king says when it comes to the word? Because Romans 10, 17 says this. Consequently, someone shout consequently. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Faith is what moves mountain. Does anybody believe that? The Bible says faith of a mustard seed. Pastor David, you know, alluded to that earlier during the giving talk. Faith has the power to move mountains. But how does faith grow in our life in order to move that? It says faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about who? Not my problems, not my pain, not my damaged goods, but hearing about Christ, hearing what Jesus has said, hearing the spoken word, the written word of God over my life. Has anybody believed God's word in your life and God came through with it? Come on, somebody. But how often do we forget what God's spoken over our life? How often do we allow what other people are saying to speak louder than what God is speaking? How often do we allow the world to be louder than God? We allow our pain to be louder than his promises. We allow our sickness to be louder than what what he has said. And so what ends up happening in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9, starting in verse 7, something amazing happens. Don't be afraid, David said to him. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. Meshibbeth bowed down and said, what is your servant? That you would notice a dead dog like me. Isn't that how we feel coming to God's presence? God's speaking to you. You're going to eat at my table. You're not just going to eat at the service table. You're going to eat at the king's table. That's your position with me. Someone shout, that's my position with God. It's not as a servant, but it's, it's to eat at the king's table. But what did Mephibosheth say? What is your servant that you should notice a dead doll like me? Why? Because he keeps p- paying attention to his damaged goods. Verse 9, then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops that your master's grandsons may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. I don't know about you, but that is good news, church. This is amazing. Before this moment happened in 2 Samuel chapter 9, there was this moment that happened in King David, unlike any other king in history up to this moment. Instead of killing the entire lineage of King Saul, compassion came to him. Almost like a compassion like Jesus. And this compassion said, you know, is there anyone in Saul's house that is still alive? Is there anyone from his lineage that is still breathing today? I want to bless him. And there was a steward of King Saul. His name was Ziba, which we just heard about. Ziba, when asked 
when he was asked, is there anyone living in regards to um, Saul's lineage, Ziba comes up to him and says, well, there is one. He's crippled. He's been crippled by birth. And not only is he crippled by birth, but he's living in the land of uh, Lodora. And I guess I could tell you his name. His name is Misbibosheth. Instead of giving his name, he describes him by his pain. <laughs> he describes him by his damaged goods. I don't know about you, but man, some of you have been labeled by your damaged goods. You, you're labeled by, your, by having premarital sex. You're labeled by your divorce. You're labeled by your past pain and past hurt. But God's saying, I'm about to write a new name on you. In fact, that's not even a new name. It's the name I gave you before you even had that name. I'm about to give you that name and restore that name and restore you at the king's table. But you, but you got to believe the word spoken by the king. And so here is Mephibosheth. What would happen if he didn't listen to the king? What would happen if he just kept thinking of himself as a dead dog? You know what he would have lost? He would have lost generational wealth that God was trying to put in his life that day. God's like, I'm not only going to give you the wealth of your father, but I'm going to give you the wealth of your grandfather. I'm about to place it over your life. But will you, be, will you believe the word that has been spoken over you right now? Someone shall believe the word of the Lord. There is generational wealth and prosperity that, wants to, that God wants to give his people. If we can just believe the word that God is speaking over your life. There is spiritual blessings. In fact, Ephesians 1, 3 says, God has blessed me with every spiritual blessing. There is no limit to what God wants to bless you with. There is no limit to what heaven wants to put over your life. But will you believe the word of the Lord? Someone shout with me this morning, we are all damaged. Someone shout with me, talk with the king damaged. Someone say this loud and, say this loud and proud, believe what the king says. What has God said about you that you still don't believe? Let's get real this morning. What has God said about you that you don't believe? What are some promises? I say them a lot. Some people get tired of them. When are you going to stop saying these promises? Till you start believing them and I start seeing you manifest them. Promises like you are the head and not the tail. Promises that you are above and not beneath. Promises that no matter what, it, no, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Come on, church. Because somebody help me this morning. Someone, so promises that God wants to bless you with generational wealth. I rebuke the spirit of poverty in Jesus' name in this church and over your life. I'm not this neighbor to claim it, pastor, but I am a pastor to believe that if God says it, he's going to do it in Jesus' name. That whatever God said, it's yes and amen. Pastor Mark, then pray that God's going to heal your arm. I believe God can heal my arm, but if he doesn't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe he's going to do it later on tonight. And if I pray and if he doesn't, I'm going to believe tomorrow. I'm going to keep believing until Jesus breaks the sky and I'm brought back into heaven. Amen. I will believe God's word till the day I die or I'm raptured up in the clouds. Because someone give God praise if you believe that this morning. Why? Why? Because I believe what the king says. You can't talk me out of what God's spoken over in my life. There are times that, man, I want to talk myself out of it. There are times I don't feel it. Can I be honest with you? I don't feel like preaching right now. I've been in pain the entire time. In fact, first service, I got so excited, I went to throw my arm out, and my God, my, my clavicle told me, yeah, how you like me now? <laughs> I was like, why are you preaching? If Jesus can carry a cross, I can carry this arm brace. If Jesus could be nailed, what? this is little <laughs> compared to the love of Jesus that was given for me. What would happen if we got to a place where we stopped, we stopped making excuses for living for Jesus? What would happen if we got to a place where we were dedicated like the Lord? What would happen if we got to a place where we were like Jesus and we started to love people back to life? 
I'm telling you what would happen. We would, see, we would have revival. Lost loved ones would come to know Jesus. People who wanted nothing to do with the church will understand that the church is the hope of the world. Because we recognize that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Because I love the church. He loves the church so much that he told them in the Bible, men, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. You can't love God and not his church. You can't love God and not be committed to his bride. You can't say you follow Jesus and you don't want to serve and follow what God is doing with the local bride. But the question we have to ask ourselves this morning that we have to be transparent with right now, that we have to stop hiding. What has God said about you that you still don't believe? We, we're, here we are talking about Mephibosheth, but Mephibosheth is you and I. Some of you are still eating at the servant's table. Some of you are still living with a poverty-stricken mind. God's like, no, I've called you to be at the king's table today. And for all your life. See, here's the thing about the king's table that's amazing. I, had like, I, I got like five points. I, there's no way I'm going to have time to preach all of them. Come back next week. I'll, I'll hit them all up. I was talking to PJ about it, and he reminded me. I'm like, man, I got to hit this, man. Um, hey, at the king's table... One of the things that was that, that Hebrew people did when they when they would eat at the king's table, that they didn't just put an apron over them, but there was like somewhat similar to it was similar to a robe that they placed over the lap of each person. Like it was a literally an elaborate napkin, an elaborate covering. Someone shall cover it. That they put over the waist that covered the waist all the way to the toes of their feet. Why is that important, Pastor Mark? Because as Mephibosheth is sitting at the king's table, as all the other king's kids are walking in, as all the other dignitaries are walking in, none of them see his damaged goods because of the covering of the king. I'm here to tell you God is wanting to cover you. The Word of God says that a perfect love covers a multitude of sin. What, what is he saying? What are you saying? That there is a covering God wants to place over your life. A covering that God wants to place over your mind. A covering God wants to place over your heart and life this morning. But will you believe the Word of the King this morning? With everybody standing at your feet. There are some people in this place. One of the main reasons why it's hard for you to lift up your hands because of the damaged, crippled parts of your life. And God says, will you allow me to cover you in my love? Will you allow me to cover you in my grace? Will you allow me to cover you in my mercy? People are like, man, you need to talk about the judgment of God. The judgment of God is when the trumpet sounds and all the dead who are in Christ arise and then judgment takes place. Till then we're living under grace. I understand the importance of living a, a holy lifestyle, a sanctified lifestyle. But come on, somebody. Can we talk about the love of God and the grace of God first? Can we talk about the thing that heals people, sets people free? The Holy Spirit is what draws people to repentance. But God uses people and the love of compassion like Jesus had for Mephibosheth. Amen. People who will put a covering over people. People who will start loving people back to life. I don't need people telling me my issues. I need people to love me back to Jesus and show me the love of Jesus and what it's really meant to look like in order, in order for me to live it out loud. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we close. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we close. God, I thank you for your grace and your love this morning. I thank you for your covering of your grace and the covering of your love and the covering of your mercy. Some of us here, we feel that we don't deserve you. They're right, we don't. <laughs> we don't deserve you. But that's why you gave us your grace because it is undeserved love, undeserved forgiveness. 
We did nothing to earn it. You just graced us and gifted it to us. And all we have to do to experience this grace is receive this gift that is freely given today. And so, God, we live for you not because of your law. We live for you because of your law. We understand we, none of all of us here who got married didn't get married because of the law of being married. <laughs> that is the craziest thing in this world. We got married because we fell in love. We fell in love. God, let, let, help your bride to fall in love with you again. That we live for you not because of the law that you've given us. We live for you because of the, law, the love that is being shown over and over and over again. It's what redeems us.